Aloha and welcome to this module on open source software. I wanted to give you a very kind of biased and partial overview of uh, the history of open source because I think it's fascinating. And then the module itself is going to um, provide some guidelines on how you can participate effectively in open source software development. So let's first look at history. And the cool thing about it is that at the very beginning of software, which is, you know, the 50s and 60s, software was free. It was open source, and that's because the manufacturers didn't really think that software, the code, had any value. Um, it was the hardware that was of value to them. And so there weren't any licenses or anything, and they just shipped the, the code out. What happened uh, a little later on was as the amount of software actually grew, businesses recognized that software constituted intellectual property. And so um, there were a variety, there are a variety of ways to protect intellectual property, among them licenses, trade secrets, um, patents, and, and non-disclosure contracts, and folks, businesses used all of those mechanisms to try to prevent this intellectual property from being used by others without paying them. So in the 70s, um, a guy named uh, Bob Fabry was um, working on Unix and decided to create this new um, version of Unix called BSD and um, had a, created a license for it called the BSD license, although you still needed an AT&T license to actually make it work. Over on the other side of the, of the United States, um, there was a grad student slash, I forget if he was a grad student or just a programmer, anyway, he was working in the MIT AI lab and he decided to um, uh, to form, to, to figure out how to solve this problem of software not being freely available for everybody to use due to these license restrictions and do so by um, thinking about almost a new philosophy of software development and this philosophy was described in something called the GNU Manifesto, and then he created an organization called the Free Sound Software Foundation to try to move these principles forward. And I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, now we get to the 1990s, um, and Bill Jolitz um, re-implemented the, the AT&T proprietary parts of BSD Unix, so there, there was now a completely free version, um, and that created, you know, a, a whole kind of program family of Unix-like operating systems, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, etc. Okay, um, so that there was a push, you know, kind of a major, um, uh, or, or, or a, a major surge of interest in the in that in open source in these systems from that. Over in Finland, uh, Linus Torvalds, who was just a graduate student in computer science, just like any of you guys are, so you know, heads up, you can do. You can change the world um, yourself if you if you want. He um, basically created his own version of the Unix kernel and called it Linux. And um, in combination with the various GNU um, applications, the compiler, the editor, etc., um, he basically got a complete Unix-like operating system working. Okay, so that's all good. But if you don't have easy ways to distribute this stuff. If you're sending around magnetic tapes, which is what people were doing in the old days, then again, you know, the, the reach and the, and the influence of, of it is limited. So the third part of the kind of the equation or of the TNT was the advent of the World Wide Web, which created a protocol for really much more easily sharing things. Before the World Wide Web, we have Gopher and FTP and so forth. So there was ways to do it, but the World Wide Web made it just much easier for people to um, distribute information. Okay, so we're all connected now. We start using each other's software, and what we find, or what happens then, is that there grows up. The other thing that kind of happened around this time is that the internet stopped being a strictly non-commercial network. Back in when I started using it, you were forbidden from having ads or or talking about your company's products on the internet. I know that seems completely crazy. I'm a gray beard now, but back in the day, that's the way it was. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, come mid 90s or early 90s or late 80s, I forget when exactly, but you know, the internet became commercialized. And so now what happens is there's people saying, you know, these restrictions on this free software that the GNU license imposes 
um, are, are a little too draconian for our taste. We'd like to have a way for people to easily share things, but uh, in a kind of a more business-friendly manner. The problem with the GNU manifesto was that uh, the, um, well, the, it's not the problem with the GNU manifesto, but the way the manifesto was trying to ensure that software once distributed to the community would be forever, uh, all subsequent modifications to the community would also be made back to the community. So in order to implement that aspect of the manifesto, the GNU license defined this idea of copy left as opposed to copyright. And the idea is that once you're, whenever you make modifications to a program software under copyleft, your modifications must be made freely available. You can't take the software private. You can't take GNU software private and distribute it to others, you know, just in binary form without making your modifications available as well. Okay, so, um, so that's, so what we have now is we have the GNU license and we have these people that want less restrictive licenses. They'd like licenses that allow people to take open software that's publicly available and potentially, you know, take it private or, or do things uh, to it that aren't provided by the, the GPL. So this is the GPL and, um, and the essential problem with it, as I, as I was saying, is they want to make changes because they were nervous that it would be too difficult, essentially, to make money um, from software that was going to be forever free. And they, some people just didn't agree with this kind of philosophical crusade of, of Richard Stallman. And so they came up with this idea of calling, uh, talking about open source software as opposed to free software. And uh, they had 10 principles that, that licenses to, must satisfy in order to be defined as open source. Um, and it doesn't require this kind of viral aspect that the GPL provides, although the GPL satisfies all these definitions. Okay, so we have free software, which is the uh, kind of GNU idea, which is to essentially guarantee that work that was produced in an open manner would forever remain just as open as it was originally versus those who say create things in an open manner but allow future users to modify things more or, or change the license or use it in, in, in less restrictive ways. And then there's these people called Floss which is an attempt to kind of create a big tent over both the open source people and the free software people. So here's an MIT license. This is a much less restrictive license. You can basically do anything you want with it as long as you include the license in what you distribute. Apache software license, another one less restrictive than the GNU license. Then there's a Creative Commons license, which is quite similar to open source license, except that it's more intended not for source code, but for other kinds of artifacts like image files or, or text files or videos, etc. Okay, so that's um, that's the lic licensing aspect of open source. Then there's the actual development process for open source, which is significantly different from what you typically find within a company where you have a, you know, a small or maybe large group of people, but there is kind of a head of the project who is more or less the benevolent dictator and can describe uh, or, or constrain what people can and cannot do. Um, and uh, to kind of understand the differences, there's this very famous paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Um, I'll provide it as an optional reading for you. And uh, the paper describes, you know, the, the, there's these two styles of development, a cathedral development with a careful architecture, controlled changes, and the bazaar um, style of development where you have lots of releases, everybody can make any kind of change, um, anybody can fork the software, in fact, Git was a mechanism that, that Linus Torvalds implemented in order to really support this kind of bizarre style of development. And the paper describes Raymond's experiences building some software using the bizarre approach and what happened. And in fact, this paper was so influential that folks at Netscape decided to open source a very important component of the World Wide Web at that time called Mozilla under this model. Okay, so what does it mean to develop software in a bizarre style? Users should be co-developers, they should have access to the source, they should be able to report bugs, 
And there's this famous quote, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. It means if you can get enough people to look at the problems, somebody is going to be able to quickly come up with an approach to solving it. Um, you know, don't bother about getting it fully implemented before you release it. Um, integrate it quickly. Have, you can have lots of different versions. Um, try to modularize as much as possible to support as much parallel development as possible. Um, and the decision-making structure um, has, can, can be much more flexible. So I think the, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses to open source development. Um, I think the, you know, the, obviously the strengths are the flexibility, the available to bring other people into it. The weaknesses is that you, know, you can have forking. Sometimes forks um, kind of are detrimental to the health of the system as a whole because it divides the community. Um, and um, you know, they, they, it may not have the kind of continuous support that can be available in a, in a non-open source product. Okay, so there's this idea of a pyramid of, of merit, a pyramid of meritocracy. The idea is that that open source projects, you know, the people who are really good and really committed, kind of rise naturally to the top, um, as opposed to whatever politics puts people in control of projects and industry. And so there are these nice little. Um, graphics you can look at, you know, you go from a starter up to an elder, and you can be a visitor, novice, regular leader, and then elder. Um, that, you know, that may or may not happen. Okay, so, um, so all along you might be asking yourself, well, how can you make money off of something that you're giving away? And in, case, and in fact, there's some well-known examples of software systems that are open source that make money. MySQL is a great example. It's owned by Oracle. Um, Oracle has their own, you know, proprietary software, but they um, still support MySQL. It has a very active uh, development base, and the notion is that that they have about eight thousand customers um, who who pay a fraction of what they pay for the the Oracle proprietary version. There's a thousand free users, but Oracle believes this is a good business model because it's going to people start using it for free, and then eventually they're in a situation where they need um, professional support and then they enter into a service agreement. There's also a lot of different, um, uh, there's the open source is spread beyond the code community and you can see you know, from Wikipedia to biotechnology um, to you know, Coca-Cola, there's open source versions. Okay, so what does open source mean for you? What I think it means for you is that, as I've said before, as a student, participating in open source projects, creating open source software, is one of the single most valuable things you can do as a student in computer science because it provides tangible artifacts that future employers can look at to understand what you're actually capable of. Okay? Um, as a developer, so when you're developing open source software, you have to think about the license that you choose because it actually has non-trivial implications for what kind of development community, if any, grows up around your software. And then if you're thinking of starting up a business, you might find that using, an open source, using the open source paradigm can actually provide advantages to you from a, from a business sense.